pressure effective. Maybe I'll switch over to that right now. So um, over the, uh, the last day, um, we covered a lot of material. Um, we start in the morning with this gnarly difficult, gnarly and difficult um, challenge that confronts almost any modeling problem. And, and that is the, pro the, the challenge of, of model conceptualization. Um, to introduce this challenge, I put up a diagram which showed sort of common stages of modeling process going through model conceptualization and model mapping and model formulation and model calibration and testing and, and you know, scenario analyses. I think there's a may have been called policy analyses, but scenario analyses, et cetera. Um, and it was iterative. Um, but the first stage of it, the conceptualization stage um, is arguably the most important because um, when one heads out in a certain direction, it's really useful to, in order to get to your destination within a quick, you know, timely, impactful fashion, it's important to know where you're headed. And um, while there's a lot of learning that goes on during the modeling about what your needs are, often you have certain needs up front that will help you constrain the modeling process, help you focus your energies on a smaller set of factors. And for the model conceptualization exercise, um, uh, yesterday, it, it came in two real forms. One was um, in the form of uh, the formal comments I offered, um, including some props I'll get to in a minute. The other form it came in, was um, individual discussions with the various projects where you know, I sort of offered my comments on some of my thoughts on elements of plausible or attractive route forward. Um, I'm not fully satisfied with either of those, but it gives us a beachhead to start learning and we'll be working on those further. For the first of them, the, the formal comments, the support materials. I, I um, pointed you towards three types of support materials that students in the past have found helpful. One of them focuses on this distinction between endogenous factors, exogenous factors, and factors which are ignored and consciously ignored for now. And uh, the endogenous factors are factors the model generate for us. It generates those variables that are considered endogenous. Exogenous things are told to the model. So endogenous things the model tells us, exogenous things we tell to the model. And um, often it's important when you're thinking the model should include X to really think through, okay, does it need to generate X or is X something we specify, we pre-specify? Um, and so going through that exercise of delineating those factors is useful. But because the modeling pro uh, project is evolving itself over time, you know, often you start with one division between endogenous, exogenous, which is ignored, and then it evolves. So that was one helpful, what, that was one division that many students have found helpful, many modelers have found helpful. And um, which can sort of help communicate to reviewers, to, to dissertation readers, et cetera, you know, what the scope of your model is. That, that relates to the scope, what's included and in what capacity it's generated or, or, or pre specified. And it reflects the fact that these models give rise to emergent behavior. They're generative in nature. Josh Epstein, formerly of Hopkins and, and now of NYU, I believe, um, uh, had, had uh, written a book some, some years back on generative social science. And I believe it may be a list of one of the readings um, that I give reference to an article he wrote on the generativist perspective, where he argued that you don't really understand a phenomenon, phenomenon in the world, 
phenomenon in an organization, individual local behavior, until you can generate it without presupposing. So you, you, you build a model that gives rise to that pattern without having it pre-specified. So that model we ran on the first day, which showed sort of those waves of infection spreading out. Those waves of infection weren't specified directly in the model. Nowhere in there did it say create a circle which expands outward. Rather, it was generated by that model. That very first model we looked at where there was weight change and people's decision-making about food intake and the effects of parks, that induced, that generated certain associations between variables like a person's weight and the distance they live from a grocery store or the rel the, how much further they have to go to a grocery store than to a convenience store, that, those sort of variables. It induced those distributions. And there are patterns there that were induced, that were generated by that model. And so it's part of our craft of dynamic modeling, regardless agent based system dynamics or compartmental modeling or discrete event, that we're dealing with these generative systems. And so endogenous factors tend to be really important. And that's why sometimes this, this old tired chestnut that you hear about models, garbage in, garbage out, you know, often runs into real limitations. People who, who haven't used models before might be carrying around the concept of a spreadsheet. You know, you plug a bunch of numbers in and out comes a calculated form. And, um, you know, this is missing many things at a, at a most basic level. Uh, it's missing the opportunity to calibrate this model, which, which we'll be talking about particularly tomorrow. Uh, it's, it's missing the fact that this model is evolving. It has an internal state that's evolving over time. And often these outcomes, uh, which arise from that, are, are not merely you know, combinations of these data in, they are, they are patterns that emerge not just from the data in, but from the structure of the model. And you know, depending on what model type we're, we're dealing with, how we characterize the structure is different. Um, in a stock and flow model, using system dynamics widely, you know, we have stocks and flows. In a discrete event simulation, we have restructured resource limited workflow, generally capacitated, limited by capacity. So person's progress down them will be limited by available capacity, availability of resources like physicians and x-ray machines and, and you know, access to ultrasound uh, or to a gurney or what have you. But for agent-based modeling, the kind of how we characterize the structure of the system is more involved. One part of it to be sure is state charts. Um, and we've certainly seen our share of those. I don't have to sketch one out here. We could simply share my screen and, and show it. Um, uh, you know, show one um, directly. This is one way we characterize structure. But as we'll see, there's more ways. We learned about another way yesterday. We learned about sort of an event that could trigger trigger some action, for example. And 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 that imposes a certain structure that monthly this thing will happen. We saw agent interactions with with messages for example, and, and those messages were transmitted over networks, networks in space yesterday. And uh, networks are aspects of model structure as well. Um, you, you're imposing a certain network structure. And there's many other aspects of structure, those decision-making um, action charts, they're called, which I showed in that model on the first day where we diagrammed out people's decision-making process. Those are another type of structure. Um, so structure in agent-based models is more dynamic. What you co see coming out is often, is often as much a reflection of structure, and often it's much more profoundly influenced by structure than just by the data in. And it's in this structure that a lot of expert knowledge lives. 
It's the structure of the system captured. It's what influences what. This endogenous exogenous ignored uh, distinction points to the importance of endogeneity. Right? We're generating factors. And we're generating factors uh, with patterns that emerge in large part because of the structure of the model. The data that we plug in for parameters often just tunes it within some broad ranges dictated by the structure. And this notion that you can plug in any data and get any output is completely bunk with dynamic models. Actually, very commonly, the structure constrains the behavior so much that you can plug in all sorts of assumptions about parameters, and there's just no way you're going to get out um, certain types of, of outcomes. There's no way in, in an SIR model where people are getting infected over time and there's no replenishment that susceptibles will do anything but stay the same or go down. That, that's the only, you know, the only question is how, how quickly, et cetera. So, so this idea of, you know, that, that you can match anything you want with just playing with the numbers and so on, that's, that's actually not the case. It's just often this expert knowledge or, or informed knowledge that goes into the structure that shapes things and, and the endogeneity, the, the generated factor. And we learn from that endogeneity, we learn through observation of these outputs, um, factors we didn't know. Um, we learn this structure is inadequate for characterizing a certain phenomenon in the world, or we learn that it, a very simple structure can produce patterns. Think selling segregation. So that was one element of that we turned to for, for thinking about model scope and model conceptualization. But there were two other elements too. And those two other elements also link into exactly these issues that I'm discussing. The second of them asked students to think about causal pathways generative pathways, to use the language of, of Pawson and Tillin. Um, these are posited, postulated sort of um, types of interactions between variables. We may be interested in a set of variables and, and their relationships between each other. And just as in Pearl's causal modeling, for example, statistically, we, we postulate that there are certain relationships between them. I, I used puzzle diagrams as a way of doing that, and I noted those to be adapted more fulsomely to open case models. And there we're talking about the structure of the system, what depends on what, um, which can then often be refined as how it depends in the model formulation stage. So, you know, that second exercise or that second kind of point of reference that that might be useful there. Think about generative pathways and diagramming them out. Think about their relationships to each other. That's about this structure. It's about thinking about the structure of your model that in some ways mimics structure in the world. It's postulated to mirror structure in the world. Um, so that's, that's useful. And that, it turns out, cuts across multiple modeling types, but it's most prominent for system dynamics and agent based. Um, uh, it can be useful in another way if you diagram out workflows for discrete event simulation. But because I haven't expounded on that, I'll, I'll come to that later. So that was the second draw out causal pathways. And we're trying to get students out of this mode of approaching things associationally, where they say, I want to build a project that will you know, identify associations between A and B. And they're often stuck in kind of a, a statistical mindset. Um, so, so statistics commonly deals, you know, traditionally, and particularly in earlier eras, it dealt with relationships between observables um, uh, generated by a data generating process. With dynamic modeling, we're talking about the data generating. Process. We're talking about what gives rise to these things. And we often will are talking about the latent factors behind it. Now, for those who have attended my data science, system science boot camp, 
will be aware that these are not holograms. And in today's world, those worlds are colliding. And you have causal models which have rich depiction of latent structure, um, which end up being very close cousins to and, and, and broadly fit into the dynamic modeling world as well. Um, but just be aware that you know much of statistics traditionally has been built on relating observables um, uh, in 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 terms of the uh, the relationships between them statistically as observed in these patterns, and commonly those are the result of a data generation. Those are ge those are reflecting results generated by an underlying system. And we made many, many observations about different observables coming from the same underlying system. So, yes, question. For online participants? It's cutting. Uh, okay, that's, maybe I'll try to raise, raise it because I'm using a lapel mic. It's a wireless mic here, so it shouldn't depend anymore on my position. Um, I could try to raise the, uh, the volume. We just we we lie at risk of uh, uh, of the um, of getting a feedback effect. So, um, okay, uh, I'll have to figure out how to increase volume with this. It's um, it's not obvious to me. So, um, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So maybe it's something to do with this, uh, uh, with the location of the lapel mic or that. Okay. So, so those are good comments. Um, uh, I will try to engage in restraint from my cranial movements. Um, uh, so maybe people can let me know if this ends up being better. I'm, other than pinching this to my nose, I'm, I'm not fully clear on 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 how to make it uh, how to place it better. But if anyone's an expert in this, I, I would appreciate it um, guidance on that. Um, okay, so that was the the second of the tools we used yesterday, focused on sort of thinking through causal paths positing certain relationships. The third focused more on sort of the constituent parts that make up or that you need to specify for an agent-based model. And, and that was this op parties or o parties framework, which included a discussion of, of outputs and populations and parameters or attributes of agents and states. Uh, it also included actions and rules that change those states. It included something about time, thinking about time and interventions which, which might affect this system and, and really more broadly about scenarios, what if questions that you want to ask. Um, and that, that is a, again, sort of cognate to Ross Hammond's Partey framework, but Partey doesn't distinguish between state and and uh, uh, in property and, and sort of static properties, which I, I think is fairly uh, important distinction. So there we're sort of thinking through, making sure we think through different parts of a system. You know, what states are there? And what, what things are there that change those states? That is actions. And under what conditions might those be triggered, those changes? Well, that's the rule. Uh, over what time frame are we interested in looking at this? Is it very short or is it a life course perspective? Um, these are all things that that framework is designed to get you to think about. And by thinking about them, you start to be clearer and being able to specify what sort of features I need to model. It's also because for some of these have implications on others. For example, intervention, I argued yesterday on this floor, that with interventions, if, if you want to ask a what if question that involves a certain factor, a certain intervention, if you want to examine the efficacy of an intervention that 
you know, involves a certain action. You need a model that can that that can represent the effects of that intervention on the system, so you can see what the consequences are. So you can say, "Go figure," and see what the generated consequences are. So you need a, you need some nexus between the system and the intervention upon it. You know, the intervention comes in and zaps the system somewhere. And you need a plausible representation of that intervention set for it to, to, to stimulate results that cascade around the system and that give rise to you know observed um, dynamics. Um, similarly, if you're trying to develop some tests of this system, you're you're trying to assess it against empirical data to, to, to sort of evaluate adequacy, you generally want parts of this model that are comparable to data, data that you have. And um, so, for example, for this model here, maybe we have some empirical data on uh, the prevalence of heart disease uh, in the population. Or maybe we have data on, you know, the uh, fraction of, uh, of individuals of different ages who are current smokers, for example. And we might want to compare the model against that. Um, and we want places in the model to which we can share this empirical data. In other cases, the outcomes you're interested in are outcomes that you want to use for, for sort of understanding the effects of intervention. So maybe you're interested in health disparities and you want to know, you know, what, when you undertake different interventions, how does it affect, you know, uh, uh, vulnerable groups, some set of vulnerable groups versus uh, groups that are, are more, more uh, privileged or, or that uh, a person would need. And so if, if that's your goal, you need some representation in the model to capture that distinction. So often these factors like outcomes that we're interested in, output, um, uh, or interventions, um, the time frame over which we wish to simulate it, those end up often materially influenced. If we have, if we're going for a very short time frame, we might not need births and deaths because the population is is basically constant. There's very little turnover in a couple weeks of a flu of a flu outbreak or something like. Um, by contrast, if what we're interested in is a life course perspective, if what we're interested in is understanding, you know, costs and uh, quality of life implications over decades, um, you know, it is it, very common that we will be needing to think about demographic change, about people dying, people you know, coming into the population, et cetera. So often we reflect on this sort of framework to sort of get us to think what are our needs here? And it's not just creating a laundry list of those things. It's asking about what their implications are for the rest of the models. What states do I need? You know, if, if in this model here, if in this here model, you, you know, you needed to, um, you had data you want to compare this against, which related to um, prevalence of of uh, undiagnosed heart disease. You would you need in the model representation of diagnosis, whether someone is diagnosed or not. So you might have a state chart about whether they're diagnosed or not in terms of, of heart disease. Or you may take the heart disease state, divide it, make it a hierarchical state, and you have an un, uh, a undiagnosed heart disease and diagnosed heart disease within this hierarchical because we want to compare against empirical data on the, you know, the prevalence of undiagnosed heart disease in our population. So, so often, you know, thinking these things through um, helps us sort of shape a greater clarity on, on what model we need. Um, but at this juncture, a lot of this is, is a matter of of art, and it's often really useful to talk to someone who's very experienced in this. 
But one of the other biggest messages I had yesterday was, you know, uh, recognize that while this exercise might be carried about about where you want to go, when you head there, of necessity, you are walking that path in an incremental way in, in the physical world. And you need to do something comparable in the context of um, uh, of the you know, building a model. You build it step by step. You run it on an ongoing basis. You add things in and learn from them. You don't just say, OK, I want a model with all these features and just work on that for six months and then get it and figure out what to do. No, you, you, you build it along the way, and you use the learning along the way to, to better refine your understanding of what needs to be added. And sometimes you find you were anticipating adding X, Y, Z. And in fact, X was so interesting in its implications that leads to two papers. And, and Y is no longer as big an issue in Z, X. You actually got Z automatically, so you don't need special mechanisms for it. And you end up going in different directions because you've learned along the way. Anyway, that's um, you know, some question. Yes, Maya. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, this is a great question. And I want to thank you for asking. So for those online, the question was, um, when we talk about comparing our model with data, whether for the sake of validation or I'll expand your question for the sake of calibrating the model, does that have to be lineless type data? Um, data, you know, on, on say individuals uh, from, admin data from primary data collection or electronic health records or whatever source, um, you know, case, case data for each COVID-19 case in Canada, or can it be more aggregated? And I want to address this question um, head on because when we're dealing with agent-based models, one of their foremost features is that we have a very fine-grained depiction of the population, okay? And or the populations of interest. And this has great import in this area because when we have a population like this, and I will, for the sake of, of illustrating things you know, more directly, I'll, I'll, I'll run this model um, and depict said population. Um, so here's our population. Obviously, I can make it much larger, but um, the point is that this is a fairly fine-grained depiction of the situation. Obviously, it leaves out a lot of details, but it's an individual-level depiction. And so we can compare model results at an individual level, um, uh, you know, in terms of the features of, you know, how long do people manage to stay quit, um, for example, uh, in the model versus, you know, a study of, a longitudinal study of, of smoking behavior and vaping behavior or something like that. Or we can compare aggregate data from the model, you know, that's generated by the model against observed data from the world. And one of the really nice features about agent-based model is you can slice and dice the data from the model. You can stratify it by age categories. You can choose what age categories to use, maybe of different sizes. So you have, you know, you have infants divide into zero to six months since, or uh, zero to one month, you know, month one, two, three, four, five, six, and then six to one year, and then, you know, one to four years, and, and you know, four to 10, and then above that five year age category. You can slice and dice in any way you want in this model to, to match against different data. Now, this is a big difference compared to a stratified aggregate model, say a compartmental model, a system dynamics model, where you typically need to impose, if you're going to have that sort of heterogeneity, say an age, you need to impose one rubric uh, for that. Now, you can aggregate up from there, but the point is, if you have different data, which is summarized in different ways there, you're often in a bit of a messier situation because it's not divided up in the way the model divides. Here in an agent-based model, we can 
sort of total things up um, as we see fit uh, over time in a very flexible fashion. We can accumulate longitudinal data. In fact, we did yesterday, right? We had times someone has spent since quitting, for example, as a, as a type. We could have recorded the number of times this person has fallen, has relapsed into smoking, as another example. We could have compared that against it. So one of the foremost advantages of agent-based models is that you have this enormous flexibility of, of computing statistics from the model, synthetic population statistics from the model that you can then compare against corresponding data from the world. And it allows you to make use of data from the world in a quite flexible fashion. So it is not a fall uh, restricted to lineless data. Um, you can make use of epi curve data, you know, number of cases over time as a cross-sectional depiction. You can make use of longitudinal data. You can make use of data that's based on, say, a survival analysis from a real world population by having the model, the simulation model, conduct a survival analysis with its data and compare the results before. You can compute the autocorrelation function of cases in the model and compare it against comparable things for real world data. And in short, you can, all these things you can do on real world population data that's at an individual level, you can do in the model and, and basically render it into a form that's directly comparable to whatever source of data you have in the population, as long as you can have those distinctions in the population. Um, so again, if the real world data has you know, prevalence of undiagnosed individuals, you're gonna need to have your model think about whether people are diagnosed or not, at that, that degree. I hope that's helpful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'll just say. Correct, aggregate models give you, I don't wanna diss them, I use them all the time, they're extremely powerful, very insightful, but aggregate models are really limited in certain spheres. One of them is the ability to scale with heterogeneity, for example, inability to capture individual level longitudinal data, inability to effectively capture textured networks and spatial components um, other than in sort of a, a, a rough way, um, many other features, but in this sphere, you're particularly limited, yes, in aggregate models to a basically a cross-sectional depiction of the state of the population. And you know, in an aggregate model, you could have you could have I'm I'm, I'm gonna forego the you know the sort of um, obligatory nod to SEIR models and so on. People here are obviously interested in a greater repertoire and I admire that and I think it is fitting. Um, I do most of my work uh, historically outside of uh, the communicable disease space, although that's a significant fraction of my work as well. But if we had never smokers, uh, current smokers, former smokers in a compartmental model, a model where these are state variables or, or stocks or compartments. Um, you can use different terms in different subquarters of the agent-based modeling community. But if these are counts of people, right? These are counts of people. Any one time we're saying there's, you know, in our city, 53,249 current smokers, there's 75,422 former smokers and 315,421 never smokers. At any one time, I could say that. And then I could say a year later, how many current smokers or our former smokers never smoked? I could give you those numbers. But what I wouldn't be able to give you is, you know, okay, are the current smokers now just the same folks who were a current smoker a year ago? Um, they've just stuck? Or, or is it that a lot of former smokers have come back to being former smokers? You know, in an aggregate model, we don't have that ability to provide that longitudinal lens. It gives you at any one time a cross-sectional depiction of what's going on. That cross-sectional picture is evolving, 
you know, the number of never smokers will be varying and the number of current smokers will be etching out some trajectory, say current and former. Um, so it's, it's a dynamic picture and, and a quite rich one that you can get out, but it doesn't tell you about the stories of, of the underlying system in terms of you know, who these people are. are. Is it the same people? They're numbers, they're counts. They're counts of individuals. This is cross-sectional. At any point, it's a cross-section of the picture. At any point here, you really can't typically ask, except in quite specialized circumstances, you know, are these groups here that are current smokers, um, how many of them were, were in that state back here? Okay, we're in the state a year ago. Okay. So, so it gives you a cross-sectional depiction. And that's great for many types of analyses. It's very powerful. It's, it's, it's certainly a lot better than, 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 than trying to do it in your head. I mean, it's, it's very powerful, but it cannot allow you to answer certain types of questions. It, it's, it, it's like a box set of boxing gloves trying to pick up a screw for many types of questions. And there are many interventions which might depend, for example, on an individual's history, which target the intervention, say, in an STI clinic for frequent flyers. Um, I understand that term is, is no longer the approved term. Um, so the friendly faces is the, is the preferred term, I think. But the folks who come back a lot, um, you know, like uh, it'd be nice to be able to target interventions for them. But in a cross-sectional depiction, you don't have that resolution to say, is this someone who's been here before? And so hot spotting analysis, as it's commonly pursued in, in healthcare analytics and sometimes in public health, you know, that, that really doesn't mesh well with, with a compartmental model. Um, there are also sometimes outcomes you want to report um, or, um, you know, like uh, you, you, you want to take a look at COVID-19 outcomes based on a person's vaccination history, for example. Not just whether they have gotten their two doses or not, but, you know, um, how long ago was their vaccine and, and, and what combination did they get? Was it AstraZeneca and then Pfizer? But there's no way you would do that effectively in an aggregate model because it's dependent on on an history of individuals. Um, and so, you know, aggregate models are really powerful, but they're they're somewhat blunt tools for examining certain types of questions. Now that doesn't mean we shouldn't use them. No, we should use them. We should use them in the right places, and that's what a lot of this morning's going to be. Okay. Yeah. Any other comments or questions? Okay. So. Um, maybe that offered some value. Um, uh, can the view be switched to the whiteboard? Yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, so um, I think there should be a way, in a past boot camp, I had someone to actually zoom in. Watch this. Uh, um, okay, I'm gonna try to avoid zooming in to um, a non-useful area, okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm having, oh boy, look at that. Okay, um, okay, oh my God. Um, okay, I think, I think I'm gonna need help, help with this, but, um, but that gives a little bit of sense of what's on the whiteboard. Okay, yeah, thank you. You can post that, send that picture. Thank you, Larisa. Um, okay, great. Um, Photos during the boot camp are, are much valued and appreciated. Um, the contents of the of the whiteboard are a good example, and we can share them and put them up on the the, the course site. Um, okay, so those are some thoughts about yesterday morning. Um, model conceptualization is is sort of a hard part of modeling practice, but it's an impactful part. And I, you know, I'm not fully satisfied with with dealing with it, but I'm gonna try to make up for some of the limitations by engaging with the groups because there's so much apprenticeship in modeling. There's so much mentor modeling that is needed. Um, question, yes.
there's no, there's no, I mean, like given an ABM model, you can produce whatever type you want. There's no inherent um, one that's somehow privileged or more natural. There's none that that is somehow, um, you know, like ultra easy and everything else is hideously hard or something. It's easy to total things up. It's easy to slice and dice the data in different ways. What I will tell you is that if you're doing a lot of this within the model, um, um, it can it can encroft the model. Um, it can it can add add a lot of mechanisms to the model that are a bit of a distraction to the modeler because they want to think about the world, right? What's going on in the world? But you've got all this kind of scaffolding to kind of slice and dice data, um, and it it can get a little bit distracting. So sometimes what modelers will do is output data to, if it doesn't have to be computed live, you know, if there are interventions that depend on it, you need to compute it in the model because the intervention decision making, you know, whether they treat a patient or not will depend on their history. You need to have that. But for a lot of things, it's a post hoc analysis. It's a post hoc analysis that's performed and often will output data, which can then be analyzed after model operation in a flexible way. And Wade could, uh, Wade sits as master of this um, and uh, you know, could show examples um, of where essentially the model is outputting some information at a quite fine grained model that you can then slice and dice externally in your tool of choice. And R is one of the ones we use the most. And, you know, whether you aim it at a shiny app or generate HTML pages in a, in a really nicely formatted way with tidyverse and so on, um, or, or make use of other tools like Tableau is another one that, that has been used quite a lot with our models. Um, uh, or, you know, another tool of your choice is, um, it can be very effective to export, to export things. I hope that's helpful. Just be aware that there are sometimes model mechanisms that depend on people's history. And in those cases, those things have to be computed. So if, you know, if in the model to decide whether an outbreak is underway so that outbreak response immunization campaigns can be undertaken, there needs to be the data computed in the model to determine if an outbreak is underway. Like that analytics goes on in the model. Uh, so so there's, there's normally some for the model operation. But then there's a lot that's epiphenomenal. It's just summarizing things to model. In fact, yesterday we saw some operations, some epiphenomenal things. We reported the number of cases of heart disease, the number of current smokers in the population, and so on with a with a chart. Those are all epiphenomenal. Those are not governing the model's evolution. They're observing them. They're part of what are called observer processes. Okay. And often for that, we we put out lots of data and analyze it um, after the fact with script type functions. Hope that's helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Online questions? In room questions? Okay. Um oh now we're now we're, now we missed my my wonder. Okay. So um oh, oh my god. Um Okay, so let's let's just do this. Okay. Okay. So um so there was a uh, a cartoon. Um uh <laughs> there's a cartoon of a cemetery and um it was a cemetery that was gendered. It was a cemetery of men and and various tombstones there were things written there like Let's see what this button does. And you know, um, I, I wonder how, how fast this sucker can go. Um, and various other exclamations that ended up in, in bad ways for 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 um, certain segments of the population. So um, I don't want to tempt fate here. I'm gonna I'm gonna stick to the tried and true. Okay, there we go. Um, I don't want to end up in that cemetery prematurely. Um, okay, so um, those are comments uh, for yesterday. Any questions, comments, uh, or 
first before I shift uh, shift gears to oh, maybe we'll take a break. Nothing. Okay. Let Let's take a break, a uh, health break for for ten minutes here. Um, and uh, we'll I'll get the uh, slides up and uh, we'll go forward. Okay. Thanks. Well, maybe maybe I'll ask. Are are people feeling now is a good time for a health break, or do you want to wait an hour? I should ask because I, I do get the sense people are kind of in a receptive mood. Who would like a health break right now? Anyone? Who would like to wait an hour? Okay, yeah. So we'll, we'll wait. We'll wait. I'll I'll give my first comments, and then I'm I'm sorry. It's just I kind of get the I can read the the feeling of, of the room a little bit better um, here in person, and and I have that sense people are receptive. So. This is good. Okay, so um, what we're going to do is um, talk this morning about multiple types of models. Okay, and and this is going to come in two different parts. Um, uh, one is going to be the, probably the talk I least like giving in this in this event because it can easily sound like I'm just in and there's way too much tribalism. Um, and, and I really dislike sort of throwing darts at particular methods. Um, but I am a practitioner who has extensively, in over three decades, applied multiple of these methods. I started my first agent-based modeling in the 80s um, and, and did my first real scientifically um, rigorous agent-based modeling for research. Uh, in 1990, um, and started system dynamics modeling around 92, 93, um, and discrete event modeling some years later. But I've, you know, I've, I've really walked long distances with all these methods, and I love them dearly, just as a parent would love their children. Um, and I, I don't like saying that much. Therefore, you know, this child's weak point is this. This child's strength is this. Um, and you know um, the children will glare back at me, um, and with with some good reason. Um, so um, I hate giving this, but um, I am going to uh, to make some comments because the truth is we we need to we need to choose between methods. So I'm going to stop this recording.